Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today in the studio, Senior Editor for All Things Green, John Snyder. How's it going? It's going great. Thursday afternoon, I just took a bunch of frosting from a cupcake and then left the rest of the cupcake in the it's kitchen. That's the best part. Yeah, so sorry the rest of everybody here, <laughs> but it tasted good. Zach, what's up, man? Uh, I just had a smoothie, but it sounds like your cupcake uh, was probably a little tastier than that. It was good. And I used a spoon, a clean spoon. It was elegant. It was tasteful. That's It was okay. It was like taking a piece of the cupcake. Zach Palber, assistant editor, I, of course, should mention. We got a great show for you today. We've got a bunch of news that we're going to rip through, kind of hit some of the highlights. And then we're going to talk about uh, diesels and the Z4. That's what we're going to talk about in the reviews section. John was driving the Eco Diesel, and where were you driving it? Duluth, Minnesota. Sweet. Yeah. And then the CX-5 diesel has been roaming the streets of Birmingham, Michigan. So mm-hmm. we've been driving that and same with the Z4. So pretty cool cars. Lots of news that we're going to lead off the top here with though. So the Audi RS6 Avant coming to America confirmed just a couple of nights ago. Continental from Lincoln is dead or so we're hearing. Uh, Land Cruiser rumors of that vehicle's demise as well. We've seen some spy shots of the Ford Mach-E which is, we think that's going to be pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also remember Jim Dunn, who is sort of the godfather of spy shooters, which if you're a fan of our site, you know spy shots are one of the, I think, most critical things we do. We love writing about them. You love reading them and looking at the shots. But really, this all started with Jim Dunn. I had the pleasure to meet him a few times, and you know we'll touch on that a little bit too. Definitely check out that uh, obituary on our site, though. Nicely written by Zach. Thank you. Cool, cool. Let's jump right in with the RS6 Avant. I mean, let's not even like, you know, delay here. The fact that (laughs) this wagon is coming to America blows my mind. Super psyched about it. I, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty fired up. Initial thoughts. Uh, We'll start with you, Zach. Uh, This is amazing. This is awesome news. And Audi knows it too. Uh, They led with their press release and the subject of their email all new Audi RS6 Avant is coming to America, exclamation point, exclamation point, and one more exclamation point, <laughs> because they know how awesome this is. Uh, this is the the RS6 Avant. We have never gotten this here. There have been plenty of them in Europe. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, kind of what a lot of us enthusiasts have been asking for from Audi. Uh, the, the Avant, uh, in my personal opinion, is the best-looking shape from Audi and uh, the RS6 is about as good as it gets. You know, 591 horsepower, zero to 60 in about three and a half seconds. Uh, This thing is gonna be sweet, it's gonna be expensive, (laughs) but uh, you know, anybody that uh, owns this thing is gonna absolutely love it, I think. Yeah, I remember when um, months back, I think it was over the winter sometime, Audi tweeted a little summoning circle with little yes. emoji candles and in the middle it said Avant's in the US. And I was like, oh man, they're gonna do it. They're gonna bring it. I didn't realize it was gonna be the RS6 because <laughs> this, this is awesome. I'm super excited about it. Um, I love hot wagons. I feel like this is the auto journalist special right here. If it came in brown with a uh, manual transmission, that would be, that'd be it. Um, but I'm really excited to sort of test this out against the Mercedes, against the the E-Class wagon, because that thing rips too, man. <laughs> That's a good wagon. <laughs> yeah, That's a really good wagon. So, yeah. yeah. This this does really look wonderful. And, you know, the RSs I've, I've driven have all been, you know, very surgical, very precise cars. And um, to have that extra junk in the trunk back there just to haul family stuff and uh, just to look cool. Man, yeah, I'm excited for this one. Yeah. I'm a big fan of what basically the RS line does. Yeah. I think the way they, you know, tune probably isn't the right word, but the way they, you know, create, craft those vehicles, they're really precise. They're instruments. I mean, in this one, I don't know what I'm more excited about. The motor with all of that horsepower that you mentioned, Zach, uh, four liter V8, or just look at this thing. Yeah. This looks like it should have a guest spot in like the next Transformers movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the <laughs> especially I really like the the look from the rear, just the the lower rear fascia, you know, coming down the sides, the the door sills, the ground effects there are really nice. Um, the lighting on it, everything about this thing is is just gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, I think it actually looks better than, than the Mercedes. Uh, you know, I, I would 
probably go for which one drives better. And at this point, I don't really know right. which one is going to be better. Um, one other similarity between the two is that they're both order only cars. So you won't just be seeing this RS6 Avant show up at your dealer. You're going to actually have to talk to Audi and be like, hey, I want one of these. Yeah. Um, which is actually uh, somewhat of a trend with wagons. I know the uh, the V90 from Volvo is the same way, order only. But hey, if that's the way that we're going to get our wagons, uh, I am fine with that right now. <laughs> yeah. I would love to wake up on a Saturday and go to an Audi dealer or any like Mercedes or you know maybe a Buick dealer. They have some cool looking wagons. <laughs> yeah. 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 And just be like, I want this. And they're like, okay. That sounds great to me. I mean, yeah. you know, special order, that sounds like a pretty good way to do it. So, um, yeah, I think this is a great looking wagon. Interior, actually, I think, I mean, you would expect that, you know, Audi's doing a good job with their interiors, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it's a good looking interior. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, is there a downside here? No? No. Uh, no. I'm almost saying that just because we're like <laughs> trying to be objective here. And we're right. all just like, yeah, this car is awesome. It feels like Christmas. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if if you want to nitpick, I mean, we don't know the price yet, but yeah, it's it's definitely going to be expensive. But that's the same way with any of these super powered wagons. It's an RS car. It that's fine. Yeah. You know, it, it's the ultimate of what Audi can do in a wagon. It should be expensive. I just so. want it, you know, within my orbit somewhere. I want to be able to that's see true. it on the road. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to you know, drive cars for a living, so I might get a chance to actually drive it, which is fantastic. But I, I'm going to be geeked when I see one of these driving down the road. I'm going to be like, that person picked that car and they ordered it exactly how they wanted it, and it's it's a car that you know we've been wanting forever, and and very few people are going to have. I would have so much respect for the person yes. who like yeah. was driving that car. <laughs> it's like you didn't just be like, hey, I want an Audi because it has four rings and it looks cool at the golf club, like. You went for it. You're like, this is like what I want. Mm-hmm. This is how I'm going to spec it out. And I am fully aware of how good this thing likely will be. So pretty fired up. Um, you got to check out this full story. We've been talking about these pictures. So definitely head over to Autoblog. Uh, the press shots, you know, I don't normally say this, but these press shots are really good. Yeah. Like Sometimes you look at a car and you're like, oh, okay, it's kind of hard. It looks better in person. Yeah. I mean, this is a dramatic looking car. James Rizwick wrote the story, our West Coast editor. So be sure to check that out. Uh, moving along, the Lincoln Continental. Uh, basically, not going to exist beyond 2021. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, they're likely to basically will be a casualty of production is the way mm-hmm. we're breaking this down is they're going to probably kill off the Continental and then replace um, its space in this factory in Flat Rock, Michigan, which is about maybe half an hour from Detroit, and build EVs there. Woo-hoo. So, <laughs> yes, Snyder likes it. How do you feel, Zach? Uh, I think I'm, I'm less pumped than you about that. Like, I, I'm pumped about the fact that there's going to be two new, you know, one Ford and one Lincoln EV crossover, but man, when the Continental came out, I was psyched about that car. Yeah, and it's it's such a good car to drive. Um, I think that that Lincoln really did that car right, but people just don't seem to want it enough to keep it around, which which makes me really sad. It seems like it was a really good car to to bring out to sort of reinvent the brand. Um, it doesn't have to be like a car that people would buy. It just has to get their name out there, get their new sort of style out there. Um, and then the things that followed, you know, the, the, the Navigator, the Aviator, those are the things that people are actually going to buy. This thing has served its purpose. And uh, I don't know, I, I love seeing out on the show floors. I love, you know, yeah. touching those door handles and and checking out the interior. And the, uh, it's got some neat shapes to it. But um, I think that what its job was to do was to usher in the new Lincoln uh, that we know today. And that's fine. That's a savvy observation, I think. Um, from a pure product perspective, I am sad to see it go. I think this is very competitive. It was a little bit of a tweeter car, yeah. kind of between like, like it wasn't really big enough to take on like the 7 Series or the S Class uh, or equipped or priced or any of those things. But it offered you a lot. And it was sort of like an A6 Plus, mm-hmm. I would categorize it. Uh, you got a lot of power. Interior was gorgeous, is gorgeous. Uh, I think they really got the exterior right. It's a really yeah, good yeah. looking car. And in some ways, I almost think it's so understated and elegant. That's almost a bit of a problem for them, even though that's, I think, the right <laughs> tasteful look. 
it doesn't stand out that much unless you're like, oh, hey, what's that? That looks really good. That's a looking continental. Okay. So I think in some ways they needed something that was even more disruptive to really get people into Lincoln. That being said, they did a really good job with this car. And I kind of hope in some ways they find a way not to get rid of it. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the CT6 we thought was going to go away. And then it seems like it maybe isn't. I actually haven't read the latest on that. But, I mean, the CT6 was another sort of tweener, yeah, sort of 7 Series, but it was actually, I think, bigger than the Continental a little bit. Um, so, I don't know. I have a soft spot for these cars. I, I think the Continental name was the right move. I think mm -hmm. Jim Farley, uh, a few years back, basically looked at like the cards he had to play and said, hey... We could call this thing the MKS, I think is what it was in its previous life. Or we could really go big. We could call it the Continental. We could try and make a design statement. I think they succeeded with that. So Yeah, and we're uh, on our story that we have on our site, there's photos of the Coach Door edition, actually. Yeah, that yeah. so cool. I mean, that that is honestly the, the Continental that I wish they had been building from the start. And that, that, that might have made an even larger impact. Um, but, you know... At least in that product's lifetime, we get to see something that, you know, harkens back to the era of, mm -hmm. of the 60s and 70s Continentals. And But, hey, battery electric crossovers, that's that's where we're going. So, so be it. <laughs> <laughs> the one area I think it underachieved is it didn't quite capture that um, cachet like the Navigator yeah. did where, like, you see professional athletes, you see rock stars driving Navigators because it's legitimately cool. Mm-hmm. It's a prestige thing. Nobody's like, oh, Lincoln? You're driving a Lincoln, man? Where's your Benz? It's like, oh, you got a Navigator. Sure, that's awesome. The Continental was a great car. We, I think, liked its merits. It fell short in some areas, definitely. Um, but it didn't become that cool, like, tool thing that influencers had to have. And thus, it likely will not be around for much past 2021. So um, let's move on to Land Cruiser rumors. Uh, this is one that, so we haven't reported on this. We haven't been able to confirm it. Yeah. Uh, if you look around, you'll see that Toyota kind of gave like a non-denial to Jalopnik. Uh, automotive journalist Johnny Lieberman had put this on his Instagram page. So, hey, we'll just, <laughs> if you want to know more, fire up your Google browser. If we can confirm this, we will. Um, but we're hearing rumors that the Land Cruiser may be going away. I just basically would say I hope it doesn't. It's one of my favorite SUVs out there. In some ways, we might be seeing the tea leaves, though. Like at the Chicago Auto Show where they rolled out that like Land Cruiser heritage model. Mm, yeah. That's the kind of thing you do when you're about to sunset a vehicle. Um, they haven't invested in it significantly in years, right. probably no. decades. Yeah. Um, they're great. They're fun. They're a little hard to drive. Yeah. They're, you know... I don't know. Again, I get so nostalgic for vehicles that I wouldn't probably buy. I don't necessarily even <laughs> totally think they have a purpose, but I also just like these things because they're cool. Yeah, so, I'm the same way, man. I don't know. I, like, I, I would I would never buy one of these, but my my dad had them when I was a kid, when I was learning to drive. Um, so I was driving around this tank around Wisconsin, um, and I, it was it was cool. It wasn't easy to drive, but it was it was really cool. Um, and my dad loved them and, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty capable off road. Um, but it, yeah, it feels super old. And then, you know, with the price, it's, it's in the $80,000 range. Um, at that point I'm looking at, at Lexus, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they killed it off. They would, I, I don't know. So, uh, Toyota said to uh, Jalopnik, who reached out to them, that they have no plans at this time to remove this from their lineup. And they said, Undeniable denial. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see. Um, but yeah, no other uh, sources on this yet, except for Johnny Lieberman. Uh, yeah. And um, I, I, he, doesn't, he doesn't say at all where he heard it from. The other thing, too, is like if they kill it off, it could easily be a thing where like they just let this one live for like five more years. Yeah. They'll sell a yeah. few of them and then 2023 or something, hey, Land Cruiser's done. Or 
you know what frankly what some of these like what they need is a good like an oil crisis or something or fuel prices to go up mm -hmm. and then nobody's going to question this it'll just be like <laughs> well, the hummer went away like oh yeah we, of course we had to get rid of the land cruiser yeah oh this rumor you know it sort of surprised me because i remember earlier this year uh there was a report that saying hey the next gen land cruiser is on its way it's happening it's going to get the the 3.5 twin turbo out of the uh the ls um but now all of a sudden things seem to be changing a bit uh i think you know even if the land cruiser does eventually go away that the lexus lx will will live on here yeah i think it has to and I, I feel like they're gonna you know eventually do a full new generation of that hopefully with all the uh the rumored powertrain additions and chassis changes that were rumored uh earlier this year um but it 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 it's not the same. I mean, it, it's it, it's very similar underneath, but losing the Land Cruiser name is like losing a part of Toyota's you know heritage and history. You know, at the at the Dream Cruise just this past week, we saw so many these just pristine old Land Cruisers just driving around, and that's at a, a majority American event. But people have these Land Cruisers out, and they love them, and you know, it uh, would be a sad day to actually see it leave the lineup. Well, Greg, this it might actually be a really good time for you to go talk to your neighbor who was True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a previous podcast when we were doing the Spend My Money. Greg's neighbor was selling a, an old Land Cruiser for, for a good deal. I believe it. So it's a 96 <laughs> Land Cruiser, I think. And I believe the price was like $4,600. Yeah, you got to go get that. I kind of <laughs> do. Yeah, yeah. What <laughs> I need to do is- I'll pitch in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there we go. Auto blog log turbo. It's, yeah, I don't know. I- like your point there, Zach, I think the Land Cruiser really crosses over. Like, people don't associate it as, like, I mean, everybody knows it's a Toyota, but it's also, like, a Land Cruiser first and foremost. Yeah. And I think that's why you would see a bunch of them at a domestic-dominated event, even though the Dream Cruise is, you know, evolving. Yeah, I don't know. I The thing about the LX intrigues me, though, because that makes me think, if they're going to do the development work, why not keep the Land Cruiser? You know, like, that's just almost as a thought exercise. So, I don't know. Stay tuned. And I just, yeah, I don't know. They could sell the LX for even more larger profit margin. People want a luxury SUV versus a $90,000 SUV with a Toyota badge on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, for, for for the people who know, they're fine with it. But for just anybody off the street, I feel like maybe they'd edge more towards the Lexus because it's, it's a luxury car versus the the. the $90,000 Toyota. <laughs> and that's the beauty of the Toyota is it is sort of its own thing. Whereas yeah. the uh, the LX, I literally just had to Google it, even though I know exactly what it is. But I think it gets a little bit lost in the alphabet soup that is yes. yeah. the Lexus lineup. Yeah, so. it absolutely does. I, I'm, ready, I'm ready to take it by the Land Cruiser, honestly. <laughs> if they, so let me put it this way. If it means we keep the 4Runner, which I believe we heard also heard rumors that the 4Runner is going to keep you know, living on and being redeveloped. I would make that trade because I like the Forerunner more than the Land Cruiser. I don't know. What they, they, what Lexus should do is just take the Land Cruiser name. It could be the Lexus Land, the Cruiser, Lexus and they, Land Cruiser. You know. That's interesting, yeah. And then, I don't know, you still got a car that's a Lexus that people want, um, and then the people who want the Land Cruiser, they're still... Uh, something with a Land Cruiser name. Maybe. It's the same. It's the same damn thing. Maybe it's the, an interesting yeah. idea. <laughs> like, especially if you're gonna be really drastic. Like, well, why don't we give it to Lexus? Yeah, have a Lexus LX Land Cruiser edition. Mm -hmm. But or a, just a Lexus LX it? Land Cruiser. Yeah, <laughs> I think we solved this problem. There you go. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to something totally different. The Ford Mach E spy shots, written by one. Zach, yesterday, I believe. <laughs> He's a prolific writer. He yeah. is. He writes literally half the stories on our site. Uh, Give us the rundown. Like, what are we looking at here? Be sure to check out these spy shots on Autoblog. I believe they're still at the top of the site. If not, look at Autoblog, Maki, Google it. You'll find them easily. Interesting spy shots, but break it out for us. Yeah, so what we're looking at here, uh, if you're actually looking at the spy shots, is the uh, Ford Mustang-inspired electric crossover that Ford has been promising us for some time. Mm -hmm. The only... Real view we saw of it before the shots dropped was a pretty shadowy teaser of the rear end showing, you know, some Mustang-esque taillights. But uh, this is supposedly the real deal in its production body. And 
you can tell that uh, they're not kidding about the Mustang inspiration. Uh, through through the camo, you can see that it has that fastback shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's going to be you know a bit of a crossover coupe. You know, think something like uh, Mercedes GLC, but lower, way sportier, uh, and obviously electric. Uh, you can also see a bit of the leading edge of maybe the Mustang grill up there. You know, it might be a a huge grill. Not really sure exactly what's going on right now. But uh, you know, expect to see a lot of performance out of this thing. Uh, Ford has also promised a uh, forty thousand dollar base price, which is pretty competitive for yeah. for a uh, a performance electric crossover. I mean, if you look at the uh, the other electric crossovers on the market right now that you know have some real speed to them, they're all seventy thousand dollars plus with an iPace, a Tesla Model X, et cetera. Uh, but no, this uh, this car is supposed to be coming uh, around twenty twenty. Time, maybe a 2021 model year uh yeah no I, I think we're all pretty excited about this thing i mean there's there's gonna be a ton of people calling blasphemy like oh you're stealing you know all all the mustang looks and putting it on something that you know is the opposite of what a mustang is supposed to be you know a, a mustang is a it's, a it's it's a muscle car with a big v8 gas engine and then here's a crossover electric car but uh i mean you know to each their own, and uh, well, for a long time I thought that that Ford should go ahead with an all electric Mustang, yeah, and and put that forward as something you know introduced their EV lineup uh, as a performance bargain sort of thing, um, you know, make make electrifi- electrification cool. Uh, I think if you can do that with this, that does the trick. You don't have to do it with the Mustang just yet, but. Um, I have no qualms about this getting Mustang styling, um, crossover or not. Uh, I'm I'm really impressed with how Ford's sort of kept the wraps on this. They've uh, and as, as they've done with the with the Bronco and the Baby Bronco, they've been really good about about keeping uh, their information pretty waterproof, um, watertight, and like not nothing's really leaked out a whole bunch. Um, so this is really the first time we're we're seeing this in production form. Um, it's still, you know, it's, there's a lot of heavy camo on it, but the, the bits you can see, there's, there's good chunks that you can see and it looks promising. I, I like the way, it, I like what I see, at least in terms of form. Um, and I know I'm going to like what I see in terms of, you know, electric, electric performance. I think the Mach 1 name actually kind of fits with electric. I, it, it has a nice ring to it. Uh-huh. It's certainly a legendary name. I have no problem if they made Mach 1 was just one of the standard bearers for electrification. I think, I mean, you look at the history of the Mach 1, what some people like would say the Mach 1 is, it hasn't really been that in a really long time. Mm-hmm. And they also haven't made that many Mach 1s. So, I mean, by the time this thing would come out, it would be roughly what? Yeah, I think you said 2020, 2021. Yep. You know, you're moving pretty far into the into the future, and I think you do have to live in the present. So I think the Mach 1 name, good move by Ford. I'm a little less, I don't know about the crossover. I personally am thinking crossovering everything isn't, I just think that's going to be so like, you know, chumba wumba. It's going to be like a one hit. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't think it's going to well, be the real trend. Yeah, but they've they've sort of uh, <laughs> committed to it with, with their, you know, Getting rid of all their cars anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I I think, I think they're a little uh, cold footed to you know jump back into uh, sedans or, or or passenger cars right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree with your thoughts there. I just I don't think people want as many crossovers right. as maybe like automakers think they want. I think you're right. I think the market will correct itself. Yeah. The other thing too is like, and this is what I find more distressing is like, what's a crossover? It's like everything that's like a few more millimeters elevated and then you kind of round off the back. Although if this fastback thing looks how it looks at the spy shots, yeah. you could call this thing a heavy duty truck. I don't care. It That would look awesome. Mm-hmm. But it, I'm getting a little, uh, I don't know, weary of all these like sort of hatches that are a little bit higher. Hey, it is what it is. Sailor Gare, it's life. But um, I don't know. This does look good. looks very promising and... Uh, it, you know, to your point, John, this is probably the right move. An electric crossover with a good name. Yeah, it's actually giving me some some iPace vibes from from the shape. 
because the, the I-Pace, while they might call it a crossover, sure doesn't feel like one right. when you're driving it or see it in person. I think that with the, the similar fastback styling, I bet that's what this Ford is going to feel like too because it's not much larger than an Escape if it even is larger than an Escape here. You know, there's probably going to be a really small back seat and it's going to prioritize performance over any kind of utility. The I-Pace is a great example. I remember when I, we called it a crossover for months and years and all that. And then when it was in the office and I went downstairs, it was charging. And I was like, whoa, this thing looks chopped. Like yeah, the roof yep. was so dramatic. And then it was lifted a little bit, which, you know, made it actually kind of fairly tight in there. Uh, Cause you know, the sandwich was pretty thin, yeah. if you will. <laughs> but I think the I-Pace looks great. If they use that sort of playbook, sign me up. Yeah. Sounds good. Yep. I'm in. All right, so moving along, we had some sad news this week. Um, the father of spy shots, the godfather of spy shots, basically the inventor of spy shots, Jim Dunn, passed away. Uh, check out the obituary on our site. Uh, Zach, you wrote that. Very nice job. Had some nice analysis from uh, uh, some of the other spy shooters out there. Uh, if you're a big fan of spy shots like the Mach-E we were just talking about, uh, Jim Dunn basically invented these. I mean... Like spy shots are not like this thing that have always been like until he started essentially taking pictures of cars, some of which were camoed, some of which, some of which were not, uh, this wasn't a thing. And, you know, they would appear in magazines like before it was just like the old three, then four buff books. And then, you know, obviously with the, you know, proliferation of the internet in the last few decades, spy shots are like, great they're like the paparazzi they're frankly you know the what are the pillars of what we do so he was definitely a pioneer in this era um you know in some ways i think you could argue car companies have started camoing their cars because of him mm -hmm. because there was no reason to people didn't take pictures of the prototypes before uh there's some very like just amazing stories that you only would hear from like back when he started doing this back in i believe the 60s Stuff that would only happen in the 60s, like him sneaking into like GM production centers. Um, yeah, it's executives like putting out not like not a hit on him, but like if you see him, smash his camera, <laughs> that sort of stuff. <laughs> right. Which is really interesting. And, and, and Zach got on the phone with um, one of our spy shooters, Brian Williams, who was actually on uh, one of our podcasts with us as a guest, uh, podcast 554. Um, and, you know, he was sort of mentored by this person. And, uh, you know, it's just really interesting. This, this, this guy you know, had a huge uh, effect on, on the entire industry, um, from photography to journalism to people who develop cars. You know, we all, we all sort of shifted what we did because of, of what this guy did. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to put it. He... Um... Yeah, he was just so influential, uh, not just on the media, but also just, you know, like I said, of what car companies did, how they approached, you know, testing their vehicles, um, their marketing departments, because now spy photography, you know, companies do their own spy photos. Companies, mm -hmm. I would argue, they, I'm sure they would deny this, but sometimes they want their cars oh, yeah, to get absolutely. caught. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry, you don't drive <laughs> down like, you know, Main Street in, you know, wherever, at noon and just not expect to get caught. Right. So, you know, they they know. But that's all because of Jim Dunn. Um, so definitely go to our website, check out the, um, you know, the nice remembrance there by Zach. I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple times. Uh, when I was at Auto Week uh, back in the day, he would, we would run some of his things. He was still an active spy shooter, you know, right up until very recently. So, um, you know, classy gentleman. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, definitely, definitely a loss for the business. But, uh, you know, we wish him and his, you know, his family well. Again, check out uh, our website, you know, for you know, a nice recap. And, of course, uh, you know, there's some links out to the arrangements, things like that, if you are uh, local. So with that, um, let's move on to uh, some of our reviews. Uh, this week, uh, I drove the Z4, which I was pretty fired up to mm -hmm. drive. Uh, this is a vehicle that... It's the other half of the Z4 Supra Alliance, and we've been <laughs> obsessing, hand-wringing over the Z4, or excuse me, the Supra. Then the Z4 just shows up one day, and we're like, all right, sweet, here it is. Um, 
I don't know. I really enjoyed it. Put the top down, sunny out. I like the Z3 though. So I mean, yeah, the yeah. Z3 was like, you know, when I was a, a kid, or you know, in middle school, high school, when uh, GoldenEye came out, and like I was just all about that Z3. And then, you know, I I driven one, and it was it was okay. And the Z4 was a huge improvement on it. Um, but yeah, did you put any mulch in it? Any mulch? No mulch, no. <laughs> uh, but it was a great drive home. I was in that thing. It's one of those moments where you are pretty grateful um, to have a job like this. Yeah. There's actually yeah. something Jim always referenced was like, you know, hey, enjoy this. You know, it's it's got its dark moments. It's got its tough time. But um, being an automotive journalist is a good thing. Uh, but yeah, the Z4 really underscored that. It steers pretty well, I think. No mulch. Uh, turbo 4. Nice engine, mm-hmm. yep. eight speed automatic, pretty good. I like the looks. I think yeah. you know they yeah. did a good job with it. I'm glad they kind of went away from that like flame tempered styling they were doing for a <laughs> while, maybe seven eight years ago. Uh, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I uh, actually just hopped out of it this morning as well. Really, really enjoyed driving the car. I uh, tried to drive around with the top down as much as possible. I actually had to stop on the way home last night and put it up because it started to rain. <laughs> but uh no the, the the one that we have is in this this uh Misano blue paint mm. color and it is uh my new favorite BMW blue. Uh my old favorite was was the Yas Marina blue but this is just utterly stunning. I was just staring at it on my driveway and I was like this is hands down one of the best looking BMWs that you can buy today. Um just echoing some of your thoughts like the the, the four cylinder tons of torque, tons of power there throw it in the Sport Plus mode, and you actually get some pops and crackles from the exhaust, which I was actually somewhat surprised because this is uh, this is the 30i, not the M40i with the inline six, uh, which is the engine that's you know very very similar to to the Supers. It actually mm-hmm. has uh, it, it has more horsepower, but this four cylinder felt like it was you know more than enough engine for the car. I think zero to sixty is quoted in about five point two seconds. It felt every, yeah. felt every bit that fast. But at the same time, the chassis felt like it could definitely handle more. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, drive that M40i and the Super, of course. But yeah, uh, it, it, yeah. no, I mean, th- this is this is a great little chassis that, that BMW it, it has put together. I think you know it's a it's a nice little preview actually of, of what the Supra is going to feel like. Uh, I mean, I feel really good about w- <laughs> where that car I- is after driving this because this is. It's it's sports car like, and it's it, it wasn't even the M40i, so all all good thoughts pretty much about it. My question is, what I think is this is interesting. The Supra, everybody gets in that car and overthinks it to like just totally overthinks it. With the like Supra or with the Z4, it's almost like oh, this is just a really good BMW. Let's enjoy it. Yeah. So I sort of feel like there's a little bit of a brain recalibration. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go like so deep and obsessed. Like, what is this? Is the Supra? So, very nice car. A lot of fun. Hope to drive it again. Let's move on to the Eco Diesel that you drove in the uh, aforementioned Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah, kind of a fun truck. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Ram fifteen hundred. It's it's a wonderful truck already. Um, and this Eco Diesel, we had to wait a year to get this engine, but um. You know, it, now it comes in every uh, every version of the 1500, including the Rebel, which is what I spent most of my time in. Um, so that was cool. Uh, did a lot of highway driving, um, did some off-roading in it, did some towing in it, and it handles everything pretty good. It's um, about what you'd expect from a diesel. It is uh, smooth, uh, pretty low revving, um, a little bit on the high side for a diesel, but not too bad. Um, very linear. Um, you know, around town you feel the you feel that low end torque, and then when you're getting on the highway, it, it's smooth, and then it just starts to taper off a little bit before it shifts. Um, but it shifts really quickly and smoothly. And um, you know, it had no. I was towing about four thousand pounds, and uh, getting on the highway on a very short uphill entrance ramp, and it was. You know, just slightly slower than it was um, unloaded. So I was pretty confident in it. Um, 
got to do some off-roading in it. Creeps really well um, up and down the hill. Uh, yeah, it was it was a super nice truck. Um, it's it's sort of an expensive proposition though. It's um, what like forty eight, forty nine hundred dollars more um, as an option, and Ram hasn't released fuel efficiency yet. So um, I, I'm going to wait until I see what the, the fuel economy figures are before I make a final judgment on it. Cause that's, I mean, that's a big piece of the puzzle, but um, I think it's interesting. You mentioned like, you know, Hey, they don't have the fuel economy out because and we'll get to this. when we talked about the CX five diesel, our last vehicle yeah. here. Um, diesel like is becoming like, I think, the proposition is evolving. Yeah. Or at least car companies are trying to evolve it. Because a lot of times what we're seeing is the fuel economy isn't necessarily there. Right. Yeah. And this, um, you know, when I was driving on the highway, I was averaging right around 23 miles per gallon, um, which is pretty decent. Um, and yeah, and it tows uh, 12,000 some pounds. Let's see, 12,000 Oh gosh, 560. Yeah, 12560. Uh and a 20,040 pound payload. You know, it's got 480 pound feet of torque, <laughs> which is which is pretty awesome. Um but yeah, we'll see what the fuel economy is. It's uh you know, people talk about uh automakers are sort of proposing uh, diesel as um sort of a refinement proposition at, at this point. Uh I don't know if that's that's probably not Ram's deal. They're probably just selling this to uh, the already diesel acolytes out there. Um, but this did feel very refined, very smooth. I think I like the driving the e-torque uh, V8 better. Um, just a little more fun, but equally refined. But uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it was a, it was a. Great motor, uh, fit really well in the truck, and the truck itself is, is just stellar. I think yeah. that's a good way to sum up the Ram. I mean, overall, the interior, the exterior looks, all these different powertrain off offerings, I think, uh, I mean, I think Ram arguably is the best truck in the segment right now. I know those yes, are fighting definitely. words, but I think it is. No, yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I totally <laughs> agree. Yeah, no, I, I mean, and and about those those fuel economy ratings, too, um, obviously Ram hasn't put them out, but they do have the best towing out of all the other diesels, yeah. the, the F-150 diesel and the, uh, the Silverado Duramax. Uh, so I'll be curious to see, you know, maybe they'll fall slightly short of those because the other trucks are prioritizing towing. You know, the Chevy gets 33 MPG on the right. highway. That's and, hard to beat. And the F-150 <laughs> gets and it's right below it at 30 MPG. Yeah. Um, but if you really need to tow with your diesel, the Ram's the way to go. It it beats those by a couple, two to almost up, upwards of 3,000 pounds. Mm-hmm. So I'd be really curious, you know, is Ram able to get towing and and the fuel economy numbers, or is it are they making the same compromise as like Chevy, just the other way around? Yeah, so. yeah, I don't know. I know they, they put a lot of work into this third generation of the Eco Diesel. It's it's largely you know redesigned uh uses a f- very few of the same components of the last gen and um the you the refinement is there you definitely notice that this is this is a smooth quiet um just solid engine um so maybe i i know um that fuel economy was one of their you know three main targets yeah. in, in in creating this along with performance and nvh so we'll see i think uh ram rebel with the eco diesel that sounds yeah, that pretty awesome. awesome yeah man yeah. yeah. i really got on board with that it was really cool yeah and they had one with like the the, the springs and then one, one with the uh you know adaptive suspension <laughs> and yeah, they were both just a riot cool so moving on to the mazda cx5 this is a diesel we have in our fleet uh also a diesel uh, this is, uh, I'd say like a min- a mini long term test car. We've had it for a few weeks. Uh, we'll be giving it back soon. Uh, John, you are the man assigned to write up this. Mm-hmm. We're all kind of chipping in thoughts. I need to send you some of mine actually. Uh, but you know, what are your initial impressions? 
Um, well, I, I like the CX-5. Um, I was super excited about the the diesel engine when they announced it <laughs> however many years ago. Many years Lost ago. Lost count at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and largely because I was hoping, again, for, for good fuel economy. Um, but this, it, it gets 27 city, 30 highway. It's the, it's available in the very top of the line signature trim level, um, with the all wheel drive. Um, so, I mean, the, it's a decent fuel economy, um, but it's not a huge improvement over, you know, the, the other powertrain offerings. Um, and I don't know, it is, it's, it's nice to drive. It's a little rumbly, um. I think the the gas turbo engine is probably uh, more fun to drive, um, maybe even a little more refined feeling. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I, I'm sold on 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 this uh, engine in this car. <laughs> um, it runs out of steam pretty quick when you're when you're accelerating like onto the highway. Uh, it just doesn't have that top end. Um, it just it just falls flat up there. Um, but I mean, it's, it's perfectly good driving around town. And the one thing it can do that the other CX fives can't do is it can tow three, 3,500 pounds. Um, which, uh, other crossovers from other brands can do the same thing. Zach pointed out, uh, to me, the, the escape and the, um, Equinox are, are the same with their 2.0 2 turbos. Uh, but if you have to have a CX-5 and you have to <laughs> tow 3,500 pounds, more, more than 2,000 pounds, the, the, the other ones just tow 2,000, I mean, this is this is the one. I mean, I can tow a, a fully loaded uh, Airstream base camp. but That's pretty nice. Yeah. yeah. What do yeah. you think, Zach? Yeah, so this one, it's, it's a tough one for me. I am typically... Uh, Huge defender of everything Mazda. You know they they really cater to people who like driving. Uh, pretty much every car in their lineup is 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 fun to drive. But this one, I am just a, a little. I mean, I I I, I don't want to say that I I don't like it, but I am certainly less excited about it than others. Uh, you know, they're kind of trying to sell the diesel as a premium option. Um, they're they're it, it gets as good a fuel economy as the naturally aspirated 2.5 liter, uh, but has slightly more power. And uh, I'm just not sure that Americans exactly see diesel as the premium option in this segment. It just, I mean, th to me, the, the, the 2.5 liter turbo with more power close to as good a fuel economy is definitely the more premium option. And it also costs about... Forty five hundred dollars less. Yeah, the sticker on on the one that we have in the office now is forty four grand, which is that <laughs> that's a lot of money for a uh, a a small Mazda crossover when you can get uh, the signature all wheel drive with with a more powerful engine, you know, for around thirty eight thousand. Um, and John was looking up uh, how long you'd have to drive this thing to actually equal out uh, oh, right. the the cost savings. You know, all things considered, like in the best case scenario, if diesel and uh, and and gas was the same exact price, uh, it would take you 15 years of of driving to recoup all your costs. Yeah, of dri driving of like 15,000 miles a year. Driving, you know? <laughs> yeah, driving 15,000 miles a year. And I would argue that, uh, and I'd rather be driving that 15, uh, you know, that that 15,000 miles a year for 15 years in the 2.5 turbo. Yeah. It's just, it's a quicker car to drive. It's more fun. The diesel is, and it's good around town. I really like the the down low torque. It's refined, but give me the 2.5 turbo any day, I think. That's that's kind of where I land on this one. Frankly, I'm a bit surprised that they didn't can this before yeah. <laughs> before bringing it to the U.S. I know it's successful for them in other markets, um, and I don't know what the downside, what the cost is, the downside of, it failing here in the U.S., um, but I I feel like it, it very well might. <laughs> I think it's um it's definitely a niche play. It's something that if you say you're a CX-5 loyalist, 
uh, you're a Mazda loyalist, and you see this other thing, this diesel thing, it might be appealing to you just for the different driving, you know, character that you get from this powertrain. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, broad strokes, the benefits don't really, you know, pay off for you either in miles per gallon or, you know, the price premium is certainly, um, you know, off putting, you know, to me, it's like, even if there are some areas where you might, you know, get some benefits from it that, you know, you guys laid out, it's also like, well, you're paying all of us more money. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, I just, I don't know if I think the CX-5 really needs it. I think the CX-5 handles very well. It looks really good. I think it's arguably the best looking and the best handling in that class. Uh, maybe not even arguably. Um, yeah, it's I a totally agree. Yeah. strong vehicle. I think, you know, the other, you know, options you could get under the hood, that's probably enough. I, I don't know if, if there's enough of a market there for this, um, I could be wrong if there is some pent up demand, like from Volkswagen yeah. buyers or like other sort of, you know, former German luxury owners that might think, well, I might want this. And they might get people who are see- seeking out that dynamic under the hood. But really, that's the only path to success I see because there's no true tangible benefit to this, I don't think. Yeah, I mean that's that is the that is the market case I see for it is is people who, you know, came from a, say a, a base uh, Mercedes GLK and you know that's aging and they want to get something that costs maybe around the same as that that did when they bought it, uh, but they would rather have more content. The CX five is is sort of uh, especially in the signature trim level. Um, along with other Mazdas, are, are, are punching above their weight in terms of uh, quality uh, interior uh, for for the price. So I could see it looking pretty nice to to people like that who you know are already in love with with diesel. Uh, but man, you gotta really want you gotta really want diesel. To- <laughs> you gotta really want yeah. diesel to pay that much more for it, and then kind of make that like diagram of like trade-offs mm. versus like some of the benefits you could get um i mean it's interesting though that you do see car companies like chevy put an equinox diesel out there for a little while like mm-hmm. i mean it's just it's interesting nobody's like the market hasn't completely given up on it but people are moving away from it you know especially now that the germans have basically totally said no nah, no nah, we're not going to really do this um you know, I don't know. I don't think this will be the last one we see. I think we'll probably see another like Equinox type vehicle, maybe from Mercedes. I don't think Volkswagen would do a diesel again. I don't think they can. I just, no, like, no they can't do that. <laughs> yeah. But I think other companies like Mazda could do a diesel actually. What do you think about it? Because nobody, they have zero like exposure to all of the previous diesel right. issues. So if this other company offers this like clean diesel, well, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. diesel people might say, hey, I'd buy that, okay. Um, I don't know. It's definitely a, an interesting thought exercise, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and to your point about the the, the Equinox and, and the Terrain Diesel, you know, the, those cars were, were marketed and kind of slotted where I would think uh, like a small diesel crossover would work. You know, those were cheaper cars, you know, and I feel like people that maybe got out of like a, Jetta sport wagon diesel or one of those cars would want a a small car that got great fuel economy because they're they're budget conscious and this kind of goes in the complete opposite direction with you know the 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 signature all-wheel drive at 44 grand but then at the same time gm just canned those cars uh you know so maz is trying something different maybe it'll work but uh uh like i'm 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 hesitant right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good. The sales volume is going to be small, which they're probably okay with. I think it's, you know, we'll see what they deem success for this, yeah. you know, because ultimately I think I doubt we're going to see a lot of marketing campaigns for this. I think yeah. it's definitely to be aimed at a targeted market. And if they can hit that volume, sure. If not, I mean, I think it'll probably just quietly go away in a few years, sort of like the Equinox did. Um, you, you guys might not know this, but the Canyon diesel apparently is still out there. The GMC truck. Yeah. I was just like trying to Google what other random diesels are out there. And 
to me, that's actually like, for me, like trucks of any size, I think you can sort of credibly put a diesel in and people don't obsess over it. Give it the super treatment. Mm -hmm. I think when you put diesels and other things, people are like, well, hey, what's in it for me? Or why is this better? You know, whereas I would just look at a GMC Canyon diesel and think, hmm, okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. (laughs) All right. Towing. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. Well, hey. I think uh, we'll leave it there. That's all the time we have this week. Uh, Please send us your spend my money questions. We will get to them next week. Uh, It's been fun talking cars with you guys this week. Yeah, definitely. Lots of good conversations too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was was a good podcast. Good podcast. What are you doing this weekend, John? I'm going camping. I'm I'm taking that CX-5 across the state and going to the dunes uh, with some friends. I'm going to go camping. With, what, my, with my large son. That'll be, be fun. He'll like them. That'll yeah. Be, that's a good vehicle. It'll be cool. I don't know if this is true, but I read somewhere that you're not supposed to put rear-facing car seats in the middle seat of the CX-5. So maybe do some Googling. I don't know if that's huh. true because it's always the safest is the middle spot. Yeah. But maybe I think I read that the CX-5 wasn't equipped. Again, might be totally wrong on that, but... I'll hey, do my research. I, you got a kid. <laughs> I'm always obsessed with car He'll seats. He'll probably go in the... In, on the side, anyway. Yeah, since you we're gotta have be more packing room. stuff in yeah. around him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Zach, uh, what car are you taking, and what are you doing this weekend? Uh, I'm actually taking uh, my Integra home this weekend. So that I'm, sounds fun. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna be uh, actually doing some brake work on that car. Nice. I'm um, getting some new rear rear calipers, some new pads. A uh, little bit of a scraping noise back there right now. I'm pretty sure the caliper's sticking. So. Mm. Uh, yeah, I've we will uh, <laughs> be getting that in order, and uh, yeah, I'll be enjoying some '90s Honda uh, fun, I guess. There you go. <laughs> nice. Cue up the wallflowers or the gin blossoms or something yeah. from that era. Uh, John and I remember that. We were probably too old even then. It seems like, but uh, <laughs> since we're talking about weekend cars, I'm super psyched. Ford Ranger. Nice. Ford Ranger. Our semi long termer. I have not driven it yet. So, um, yeah. I mean, um, you've driven the, the one that we had yes. before, but like, yeah, this one's, uh, outfitted like pretty similarly. Uh, I, I drove it the last couple nights. Uh, man, just get on that gas with it and, and listen to that engine. It's, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> it's a lot for a midsize truck. It's, it's yeah. fun to drive. <laughs> okay. I like what it. What are you going to do with it? Mulch? No, no mulch. So it's almost September. It is what it is. No mulch is going down in 2019. We're going to punt that right on to 2020. Uh, I'll um, stop asking then. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you never know. I mean, rocks, the other thing, though, is next. <laughs> you yeah. forget about this, though. It's like you look at the front of your house until, like, November until the snow falls. Yeah. So it's kind of like eh, I, I could put some nicer things down so my yard looked a little better. But probably no mulching in the Ranger. Just driving around town, put a car seat in there. Um, I'm super psyched. Yeah. I love a truck for the weekend. That is like, yeah, pretty excited. So, hey, have a good weekend, guys. Drive safe. Everybody listening, hey, thanks for listening. You be safe out there. Said this, you're spending my monies, and we will see you next week. Hey everybody, this is podcast producer Eric Meyer here. I just wanted to chime in at the end of the episode and let everybody know that Autoblog has merchandise now. Um, We've got t-shirts, coffee mugs, hoodies, throw pillows, you name it. You can find it all at redbubble.com slash people slash autoblog or you can just search autoblog on redbubble.com. As always, thanks for listening to the show and we'll see you next week.